I don't know this many people in town. Please have a seat. As you know, I just concluded several hours the meetings with President Xi, and I believe they're some of the most constructive and productive discussions we've had. I've been meeting with President Xi since both of us were Vice President over 10 years ago. Our meetings have always been candid and straightforward. We haven't always agreed, but they've been straightforward. And today, build on the groundwork related with the past several months of high-level diplomacy between our teams, we've made some important progress, I believe. First, I'm pleased to announce that after many years of being on hold, we are restarting cooperation between the United States and PRC on counter-narcotics. In 2019, you may remember, China took action to greatly reduce the amount of fentanyl shipped directly from China to the United States. But in the years since that time, the challenge has evolved from finished fentanyl to fentanyl chemical ingredients and, and pill presses, which are being shipped without control. And by the way, some of these pills are being inserted in other drugs, like cocaine. A lot of people are dying. More people in the United States between the ages of 18 and 49 die from fentanyl than from guns, car accidents, or any other cause, period. So today, with this new understanding, we're taking action to significantly reduce the flow of precursor chemicals and pill presses from China to the Western Hemisphere. It's going to save lives, and I appreciate President Xi's commitment on this issue. President Xi and I tasked our teams to maintain a policy and law enforcement coordination going forward to make sure it works. I also want to thank the bipartisan congressional delegation to China, led by Leader Schumer, in October for supporting efforts uh, — this effort so strongly. Secondly, and this is critically important, we're reassuming military-to-military -military contacts, direct contacts. As a lot of you press know who follow this, that's been cut off, and it's been worry worrisome. That's how accidents happen, misunderstandings. So we're back to direct, open, clear, direct communications on a, on a, ba on a direct basis. Vital miscalculations on either side can are, can cause real real trouble with a with a, a a country like China or any other major country, and so I think we're made real, real progress there as well. And thirdly, we're going to get our experts together to discuss risk and safety issues associated with artificial intelligence. As many of you who travel with me around the world, almost everywhere I go, every major leader wants to talk about the impact of artificial intelligence. These are tangible steps in the right direction to determine what's useful and what's not useful, what's dangerous and what's acceptable. Moreover, there are evidence of cases that, uh, that I've made all along. The United States will continue to compete vigorously with the PRC, but will manage that competition responsibly so it doesn't veer into conflict or accidental conflict. And where it's possible, where our interests are coincide, we're going to work together like we did on fentanyl. That's what the world expects of us. The rest of the world expects, not just in people in China and the United States, but the rest of the world expects that of us. And that's what the United States is going to be doing. <clears throat> Today, President Xi and I also exchanged views on a range of regional and global issues, including Russia's refusal and brutal war to stop the war and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine and, and conflict in Gaza. And as I always do, I raised areas where the United States has concerns about the PRC's actions, including detained and ex and, uh, and, and exit banned U.S. citizens, human rights, and corrective uh, co coercive activities in the South China Sea. We discussed all three of those things. I gave them names of individuals that we think are being held, and hopefully we can get them released as well. No agreement on that. No agreement on that. I also stressed the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits. It's clear that we object to, be to Beijing's non-market economic practices and disadvantage that, that disadvantage American businesses and workers, and that we'll continue to address them. And I named what I thought a number of those were. I welcome the positive steps we've taken today, and it's important for the world to see that we're implementing the approach in the best traditions of American diplomacy. We're talking to our competitors. And the key uh, and, and just just talking, just made blunt with one another, so there's no misunderstanding, as a key element to maintaining global stability and delivering for the American people. 
And in the months ahead, we're going to continue to preserve and pursue high-level diplomacy at the PRC in both directions to keep the lines of communication open, including between President Xi and me. He and I agreed that each one of us could pick up the phone, call directly, and we'd be heard immediately. And that's uh, — now I'd like to be able to take some questions, if I may. And I'm told that Dimitri of the Financial Times has the first question. Uh, thank you. And as an Irishman, I apologize for bringing the rain. Well, holy God, I wouldn't have called on you if I'd known that. No, I'm teasing. Go ahead. Fire right to me. President Biden, given that America is playing a key role in two major global crises in Ukraine and in Gaza, does that alter your previous commitment to defend Taiwan from any Chinese military action? And did Xi Jinping outline the conditions under which China would attack Taiwan? Look, I reiterate what I've said since I've become president, what every previous president of late has said, that uh, we, uh, we maintain the agreement that there is a one-China policy, and that uh, I'm not going to uh, change that. That's not going to change. And so uh, that's about the extent to which we discussed it. Uh, next question, sorry, was Bloomberg. It appears, among other issues, that your agreement with uh, President Xi over fentanyl will require, will require a lot of trust and verification to ensure success curbing those drug flows. I'm wondering, after today, and considering all that you've been through in the past year, would you say, Mr. President, that you trust President Xi? And secondly, if I could, on Taiwan, uh, you've, you and your administration officials have warned President Xi in Ch China about interference in the upcoming elections. I'm wondering what would the consequences be if they do, in fact, interfere in the election? Well, I, may, I had that discussion with him, too, made it clear I didn't expect any interference, any at all. And we had that discussion as, as he was leaving. Look. Do I trust you? I trust but verify, as that old saying goes. That's where I am. And, uh, you know, uh, we're in a competitive relationship, China and the United States. But uh, my responsibility is to, uh, to make it uh, — make this rational and manageable so it, uh, so it doesn't result in conflict. That's what I'm all about. That's what this is about, to find a place where we uh, can come together and uh, where we find mutual interests that uh, — but most importantly, from my perspective, that are interested in the American people. That's what this is about. And that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're in a situation where we agreed that uh, fentanyl and its, pre its precursors will be curbed substantially, and the pill presses. That's a big — that's a big movement. They're doing uh, — and. By the way, uh, you know, I, I won't — I guess I shouldn't identify where it occurred, but, John, I know uh, two people near where I live. Their kids literally, as I said, uh, strange experience. They woke up dead. Someone had inserted in — whether he, the young man did or not — inserted in a, a, a drug he was taking, fentanyl. Again, I, I don't — I hope you don't have any experience with knowing anyone, but this is the largest killer, people in that age category. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess the other thing I think is most important is that uh, since — I spent more time with President Xi than any world leader has, just because we were vice presidents. Uh, his president uh, was President Hu. I'm not making a joke. President Hu and uh, — and President Obama thought we should get to know one another. It wasn't appropriate for the President of the United States to be walking — dealing with the Vice President. So we met, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 68 hours of just face-to-face, -face, just us and a simultaneous interpreter. So I, I think I, I know the man. I know his modus operandi. He's been uh, — we have disagreements. He has a different view than I have on a lot of things. But he's been straight. I don't mean that it's good, bad, or indifferent. It's just been straight. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we — as I said, the thing that I, I find most assuring is he raised, and I fully agree, that either one of us have any concern, Mr. Ambassador, any concern about anything between our nations or happening in our region. 
we should pick up the phone and call one another, and we'll take the call. That's an important progress. Uh, I am embarrassed. I think it's CBS, but I can't remember who is CBS. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. President, oh. Ed <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. Uh, can you stress the competition not the past years, there have been 180 incidents of Chinese aggression against U.S. aircraft in the Pacific, and of course, ramped up military activity in the South China. If that does not count as a into competition, then what does? And did you issue any warnings against that? Well, first of all, none of it did end up in a con conflict, number one. Number two, uh, you may recall I did a few little things like get the quad together, allow Australia to have access to new submarines, moving in the direction of working with the Philippines. So uh, our actions speak louder than our words. He fully understands. And because of the United States, there is another question about the idea of trade on the other side um, as it vice contain and out must that is there. This week you also said that we must protect hospitals. So when you weigh the target against the number of civilians by the hospital, is the operation way just well look, we did discuss uh, this by the way. Um, but we can't let that get out of control. Here's the situation. You have a circumstance where the first war crime is being committed by Hamas by having their headquarters, their military, hidden under a hospital. And that's a fact. That's what's happened. Israel did not go in with a large number of troops, did not raid, did not rush everything down. They've gone in, and they've gone in with their soldiers carrying weapons or guns. They were uh, told, uh, told, let me be precise. We've discussed the need for them to be incredibly careful. You have a circumstance where you know there is a fair number of Hamas terrorists. Hamas has already said publicly that they plan on attacking Israel again, like they did before. Through everything, cutting babies' heads off to burning, burning women and children alive. And so the idea that they're going to just stop and not do anything is not realistic. This is not the carpet bombing. This is a different thing. They're going through these tunnels. They're going in the hospital. And if you notice, I, I was mildly preoccupied today. I apologize. I didn't see everything. But what I did see, whether I, I haven't had it confirmed yet, I am asked my team to answer the question, but what happened is they're also bringing in incubators. They're bringing in other uh, other means to help the people in the hospital, and they've given the doctors and I'm told the doctors and nurses and the personnel an opportunity to get out of harm's way. So this is a different story than I believe what was occurring before an indiscriminate bombing. Uh, well, what do you got? Washington Post. I think that's right. Mr. President. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I couldn't see in the light. Uh, Mr. President, Israel's war in Gaza more than 11,000 houses just for a month. And I'm sorry, you're breaking up. I didn't. We did, we did. Israel's war in Gaza has killed more than 11,000 Palestinians just over a month and created a humanitarian disaster. Israeli officials have said this war could take months or even years. Have you communicated to Prime Minister Netanyahu any sort of deadline or time frame for how long you are willing to support Israel in this operation? Are you comfortable with the operation going on indefinitely? And is there any deal underway to free us? Thank you. Yes, no working backwards forward. Look, I have uh, been deeply involved in moving on the uh, hostage negotiation. Um, and uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here because I don't know what's happened in the last four hours. But uh, I have uh, 
We've gotten great uh, cooperation from the Qataris. Uh, I've spoken with them as well a number of times. I think the pause and that is really that the Israelis have agreed to it's down to well, I'm getting too much detail. I, I know, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to stop. The uh, but I am I am mildly hopeful. I'm mildly hopeful. Um, with regard to uh, when is this going to stop, I think it's going to stop when the uh, when Hamas no longer maintains the capacity to murder and abuse and and uh, and just do uh, horrific things to uh, the Israelis, and they're in and they still think that at least as of this morning they still thought they could. I. Uh, I, I guess the best way for me to say it is that uh, I take a look. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, acknowledges they have an obligation to use uh, as much caution as they can in going after their targets. It's not like they're rushing in the hospital, knocking down doors, and you know, pulling people aside and shooting people indiscriminately. Um, but uh, Hamas, as I said, said they plan on attacking Israelis again. And uh, this is a, a terrible dilemma. Uh, so what do you do? I think that uh, Israel is also taking risks themselves about their folks being killed and one-to-one -one going through these hospital rooms, hospital halls. But one thing has been established is that Hamas does have headquarters, weapons, materiel below this hospital, and I suspect others. But how long it's going to last, I don't know. Look, I made it clear to the Israelis that um, to Bibi and to his war cabinet that I think the only ultimate answer here is a two-state solution that's real. We got to get to the point where. There is an ability to be able to even talk without worrying about whether or not we're just dealing with uh, — they're dealing with Hamas that's going to engage in the same activities they did over the past uh, — on, on the 7th. So it, it's uh, — but I can't tell. I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell you how long it's going to last. But I can tell you I don't think it ultimately ends until there's a two-state solution. I made it clear to the Israelis I think it's a big mistake to, for them to think they're going to occupy. Gaza and maintain Gaza. I don't think that works. And so we're going to — I think you're going to see efforts to uh, bring along — well, I shouldn't go in anymore because that's been things I've been negotiating with Arab countries and others about what the next steps are. But uh, anyway, thank you all very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. This ends the press conference. When Hamas, well, Hamas said they plan on doing the same thing again, with what they did, what they did on the 7th. They're going to go in. They want to slaughter Israelis. They want to do it again. And they've said it out loud. They're not kidding about it. They're not backing off. And so I just uh, asked a rhetorical question. I wonder what we would do if that were the case. On the hostages, though, you said we're coming for you. What do you mean to the American hostages when you said, hey, oh. we're coming for you? What I meant was, I'm doing everything in my power to get you out, coming to help you, to get you out. I don't mean sending military in to get them. Is, is, is that what you thought I might mean? Uh, no, no, no. It, it, I was not talking about the military. I was talking about we, you're on our mind every single day, five, six times a day. I'm working on how I can be helpful in getting the hostages released and have a period of time where there's a pause long enough to let that happen. And there are somewhere between 50 and 100 hostages there, uh, we think. And so there was a three-year-old American child. You're darn right it is. That's why I'm not going to stop till we get her. <laughs> No, 
I can't tell you. I won't tell you. Do you feel absolutely confident based on what you know that yes. that is the truth? Yes. And Mr. President, after today, would you still refer to President Xi as a dictator? This is a term uh, that we used earlier this year. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that is based on a form of government totally different than ours. Anyway, you know what I'm saying?